And so, Lord God, when we get a good look at you, the beautiful one, our soul cannot help but sing. And that means that we haven't been looking at you a whole lot. So I pray now, Lord, by the power of your spirit, that you would help us to see you, the beautiful one, and that there is no way that we could overestimate your goodness, your greatness, your kindness, your mercy. And Lord God, we um, ask your forgiveness for constantly underestimating those very things. So Lord God, in Jesus' name, we ask that right now you would help us to preach. Amen. Speculation is running high that some alien force from outside our system has declared war on our planet. And there will be no place to hide. Hide, 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 hide a thief in the night. Hide, 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 hide. I wish we'd all been ready. Now to the screen comes a powerful story of Bible prophecy. I know what's going on. It's evil, but I'm not going to join it. A Thief in the Night is coming from Mark IV Pictures in color. Please do not reveal the ending. I love that last line. Please do not reveal the ending. Don't, don't we know the, the end? I mean, why would, they, why would they say that? Jesus said, I am the end. And he also said, go tell folks. Tell folks. That's good news. Any of you ever seen that movie, A Thief in the Night? I know Glenn has. He was talking to me about it. My old youth pastor, Gary Reddish, didn't get his message prepared one night for youth group. And so long about 1978, he showed us that movie. Now, I had my doubts at the time about the existence of, of God, but I had always loved Jesus. I mean, Jesus to me was the best idea, the best news that anybody had ever thought of or, or confessed. But after that movie, I was, well, I was terrified to doubt the existence of Jesus and yet I found myself kind of confused by Jesus, and I really wasn't sure that I liked him anymore. Whatever the case, movies like that are a great way to get teenagers to do whatever it is that you want them to do at the end of a meeting. Do things like, you know, raise their hand and make a decision for Jesus, or, or be really scared of Jesus, one or the other, or maybe both. I went on to become a youth pastor, and one night, partway through the message, I realized that I could get the kids to do whatever I, I wanted them to do, and it genuinely terrified me. Ever since a, a thief in the night, I had feared the, the revelation because it seemed that Jesus was not the same yesterday, today, and forever, like Scripture says, but that he'd change uh, the second time, at the second coming, what Scripture calls the parousia, and so having graduated from seminary, able to read some, some Greek, looking for something to teach, I decided to teach on the Revelation, but only, you know, the first few chapters, the 11 to this, this letter to the seven churches, because that kind of made some sense to me. As you know, I later published a commentary on the Revelation, this one, Eternity Now, which sold in all the major bookstores. And then we re-preached the Revelation here like six years ago, uh, beginning in 2017. And you can access that on our website. We called it The Gospel According to Jesus. It's better than the book, and you can get it for free. But when we preached that, I, I told you how I started the series years ago and at my, at my youth group. And, and, and in 1991, I didn't yet know how amazing that the revelation was, and that it really is the revelation of, of Jesus, like we were just talking about. However, I did know that it had been incredibly abused by people wanting money and power. So it was youth group. We always had skits. The kids were used to me, you know, messing with them. They were genuinely smart. I mean, these kids were smarter than their parents, probably smarter than us. So I figured that this introduction to our series would be a fun way to kind of make a point. I began by informing them that I had been doing some remarkable research on the issue of harmonic convergence, you know, in the seven bowls of wrath. And I showed them these two graphs which systematically plotted this convergence in the hermeneutical system of the apocalypse as it relates to the socio-political issues of the day, all which clearly pointed to the year in which the Antichrist would appear on the world scene, 1991. I then revealed to them the remarkable alphabetic numeric acuity so 
prevalent, you know, in the last seven chapters of the book of Revelation. And now understand, I just made all this stuff up. I'm using words, charts, graphs, big words. In other words, it was a cleverly devised myth. We had a big group. There were probably like about 120 kids or so in the room, many of them skeptical, wild, unable to shut up. But, but they were all deathly still now, utterly focused on me and what I was saying. It really made me nervous because I was lying to them. But I kept going because, you know, we had a plan. Using the overhead projector, I began doing all these calculations, filling in blanks on a cellophane sheet that would reveal the actual name of the Antichrist. So before our eyes, the name began to take shape. Saxork Midge. I looked up expecting smirks and, and giggles, but they were all just as serious as a heart attack. I said, well, this is really a mystery, Saxork Midge. What does that mean? And then I said, what if we reverse polarity? And I took the cellophane sheet and flipped it over on the overhead projector, and everyone could read the name, Jim Kruskis. Some kids started looking at me like, hey, wait a minute, because you see, Jim Kruskis was our new high school intern. He was sitting in the back of the room. The staff began yelling, get him, grab Jim. So we all ran back to the back of the room, dragged Jim to the front. We ripped off, you know, his church t-shirt, and underneath his church t-shirt was a, a Led Zeppelin t-shirt. And we ripped that off, and there was another heavy metal, secular rock and roll t-shirt. We ripped off like four or five of them until Jim was standing in front of everyone being held by staff members bare chested except for his thick curly black Greek chest hair. And, and then my assistant Matt Skinner, he yelled out, look for the mark of the beast. And we just happened to have like hair trimmers plugged into the wall right behind us, you know. So I pulled out the trimmers and started shaving. By now even the freshmen were starting to smirk and going, wait a minute, something's not right. But I started shaving the left side of his chest, revealing this huge black number six. Everybody gasped, and I shaved a little further, revealing another huge black number six. And I said, oh, Jim, this is so disappointing. How am I going to explain to the parents that we hired the Antichrist for our summer intern? And then I shaved the other side of his chest, revealing a big black number five. <laughs> and I said, oh man, Jim, I I'm sorry. I, 665, I, I miscalculated. I was off by one. <laughs> then everybody sat down, kind of recomposed themselves, and, and I asked them, now, was I off by one or more than one? And we all began pondering this question, how do we know the truth. But this is my point. Up until I finally got to the number five on Jim's Greek shaved chest, which, by the way, I knew was there because I had drawn it there before the meeting, you know, between his chest hairs. Up until we got to five, I was genuinely terrified because I realized that although I was just telling a whole bunch of outrageous lies, the kids totally bought it. I had some true facts, some wonderful Bible verses, but I had rearranged all the facts in order to give them a false meaning, a false logos. And because we're all terrified, none of us wants to be left behind. Most of us are biblically illiterate. All of us believe that we're saved by our knowledge of good and evil. I realized I could have totally exploited them in that moment. Picking up where we left off last week, 2 Peter 1.12, Peter writes, Therefore I intend always to remind you of these. And, and it, 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 the word qualities isn't in the text. These are faith and love, the things that he's been talking about, manifestations of the divine nature that has been given to us. Therefore I intend to always remind you of these Though you know them and are established in the truth that, not that you have, but literally is present, parousi, to be present from paremi, para means with, amy means being or amnes, being. 
He doesn't write the truth that you have as if truth is something you could have, but the truth that is present to you. Paremi is this verb that's used to describe the presence of, of people, a person. So what is the truth? Ego eimi, I am the truth, said Jesus. The truth, para eimi, with being, with amnes, is present, wrote Peter. See, I think Peter actually believed that stuff Jesus said about I am the truth. So what is that hanging on the tree in the garden? Ego a me. I am in the flesh. The truth. Our helper. Our husband. So bride of Christ and children of God, how are you going to know him? Last time we preached about this. You can know by taking knowledge. We call that objective knowledge, how you know objects. Or you can know because you are known. We sometimes call that subjective knowledge. And then he is the subject. But he's the subject that creates and maintains all objects, right? And according to Scripture, he's the truth and the life. So if you take him as an object, you also take the truth and crucify the life and find that everything has died, for you are the lone subject in a universe of objects, utterly alone and devoid of all meaning, trapped in outer darkness. We talked about that last time. But if you surrender to him as a subject, maybe even the subject, although you lose control, right? Because in a sentence, the subject acts upon the object. If you surrender to him as a subject, although you lose control, you may then know because you are known, and then he can tell you whatever he desires. If you do know anything, it turns out that you can only know because you are known, and everything you know is a gift from him. The way a theologian or philosopher would say this is that all knowledge, from the knowledge of a genius to the knowledge of my Down syndrome niece, Elena, is revelation. And the only appropriate response to revelation is worship. And in the new creation, everything is worship, so all work feels like play, and all movement is like a dance. None of it is forced. It's all free. In other words, it's all grace. But no matter what, the only way to objective knowledge of anything or anyone is some sort of subjective, you have to subject yourself to the truth. Subjective encounter with the truth. I mean, if you never subject yourself to the truth, You can't know anything. So if you think that the only things that are true are objects, which you can then comprehend, you are utterly alone. Just as Nietzsche or Sartre. And if you actually think that you determine the truth, you're already insane. And trapped in a cosmos, a world of your own Creation, the chief punishment of a liar is not so much that he is no longer believed, but that he can no longer believe. He's crucified the truth. But if the truth knows you, and so you know the truth, you're saved. Good news! You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. From what? Verse 13, I think it right as long as I am in this body, skinoma means tent or tabernacle, as long as I'm in this skinoma, literally, to wake you up. You know, in a dream, you're trapped in a universe of your own construction, right? So anyway, I think it is right as long as I'm in this tent to wake you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my tent will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my exodus, departure exodus, you may be able at any time to recall these things. 
Peter talks about waking them up, waking us up when we didn't know we were asleep. And then taking off his tabernacle at the end of his exodus, and in two sentences he's going to mention the holy mountain. Do you ever get the idea reading the Bible, you know, uh, uh, reading Peter perhaps, that, well, like he's picturing something totally different than what it is that you're picturing. Years ago, I was hiking through the woods with my son Coleman on my shoulders. He was about five. There were these red plastic ribbons on some of the trees along the trail. And so Coleman, he said, Daddy, um, who put those things on the trees? And I said, well, you know, I think it was probably the, the forest ranger. And we walked along in silence quite a ways. And then out of the silence, Coleman said, Daddy. I said, yeah, what? He said, Daddy, um, we can talk to forest strangers, right? <laughs> the whole time, he was picturing forest strangers. And what would happen if one of them showed up? How would he react? And so I'm glad that he asked for me to clarify my meaning. I mean, it took me a moment to figure out what he was asking. And I said, oh, no, not forest strangers. I said forest ranger. The forest ranger is our friend. If you've been walking with scripture for a while, and it's just not making sense, I think your father would ask you, like you to ask for clarification. What, what is the meaning? Many of us have been told that God wants to save all but can't save all. Or that God can save all but doesn't want to save all. But either way, at the end of our trip, he'll announce his judgment and then save some and endlessly punish others. But as we'll see, Peter's going to talk about punishment and then judgment, the day of judgment. So, Father in heaven, what are you saying? And Peter, what are you looking at? Well, he just told us about an exodus, some tents, and a holy mountain. And remember, most all of 1 Peter was about this holy mountain because God was building this temple. It was coming down on this holy mountain. You know, the Bible's so fascinating because it's really not a rule book. Although it does contain rules in a coffin in the holy of holies under a throne on which stands a slaughtered lamb in a tent. The Bible uh, isn't a rule book or a how-to book, but it's an amazing story in which God has his people experience things for thousands of years before he explains what they mean. In other words, he knows us in order that we would know him. Like I said last time, my children knew me long before I could explain myself to them. So Peter writes, I know that the putting off, apothesis, it's a term he used in 1 Peter when describing baptism, I know that the putting off of my skinoma will be soon. Skinoma only appears in one other place in the New Testament, Acts 7, when Stephen talks about David finding a, a skinoma, a dwelling place, a temple for God. Skinoma and skene, both kind of the same words, they're synonymous. They're both translated tent or tabernacle, and they're used in the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, to translate three different Hebrew words referring to tents, tabernacles, or booths, all often in, and often in reference to the temple. So why did Peter use it here? And why did the translator translate it as body when the common Greek word for body is soma that gets used throughout scripture and skene literally means tent. Well, Peter is obviously referring to more than his own body, right? More than just his body, uh, but another body. He's referring to, he is referring to his body, but also to, to a tent. Like we said in our sermon from 1 Peter on December 10th, the tent, the tabernacle or temple in scripture is like a, it's like a fractal. It's like a repeating 
pattern. Peter, John, Paul all refer to us together, and each one of us individually as a skene skenoma or a, a tabernacle. And they refer to the tabernacle, you remember, that God had the Israelites build in the wilderness in the same sort of way. And they refer to the temple that David and Solomon built on the holy mountain in the promised land in the same sort of way. Same pattern. And in the tabernacle, which is the temple, there is an inner room, which is the presence of the age to come. And in that inner room, there's a throne. That's where judgments are made. It's a judgment seat. In Exodus, during the Exodus, you know, the journey of Israel, Israel from bondage in Egypt to life in the promised land, God commanded the Israelites to observe seven festivals, the way, the way some people count, count them. Seven festivals like the seven days of creation. And three of those uh, festivals were to be pilgrim festivals during which all the Israelite males, which was a way of referring to all of Israel, they were to travel to the place that God would designate in the promised land where they were commanded to party. That place turned out to be Jerusalem on the holy mountain. In Scripture, only three places are referred to as the Holy Mountain. Jerusalem, that is up on Zion. Uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, which nobody is quite sure where that is. And Eden, where man is made in the image of God at a tree in a garden guarded by cherubim and a flaming sword. Now the geography, the geography gets really confusing because Scripture is testifying to a place where heaven touches earth, or vice versa, where space-time touches eternity. It's referring to the beginning and the end and the way in between the telos, like we spoke of in First Peter. The, the, the three pilgrim festivals, which are also harvest festivals, okay, are Passover and then Pentecost and then Tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles. Passover should be very familiar to you because now we celebrate it on Good Friday. And we also celebrate it every Sunday because Jesus is our Passover lamb. You remember that God had the Israelites sacrifice a, a lamb, then brush the blood on the doorposts of their homes, and then eat the lamb in haste. And so, in this way, they're saved from death and begin a journey to the promised land called the Exodus. The Passover is also a harvest feast or a harvest festival celebrating the first fruits of the barley harvest, and Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Firstborn from the dead. First fruits, according to Paul, and it's singular in the Greek. Pentecost is maybe a little less familiar, but you may be somewhat familiar because we celebrate Pentecost when? On Pentecost. Yeah, on Pentecost. And we remember how the Holy Spirit fell on the church. But God commanded the Israelites to celebrate Pentecost long before that, while they were on their journey through the de desert, 50 days after the Passover, when he gave them the law. So Pentecost is to be held one week of weeks. That's seven times seven. 40, 49 days plus one, the day after that, the 50th day after Passover, after the, on the 50th day after the Passover sacrifice. And you remember that, that Jesus, he delivered up his spirit, right, on Passover. Into your hands I commit my spirit. But that spirit fell on the church at, at Pentecost. That's the spirit of God who is love that fulfills the law in us. So that's the law placed within us, within our hearts. Pentecost is also a harvest festival celebrating the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And James writes that there are, uh, th that we, we are a kind of first fruits. And it's with wheat, you know, that you make bread, bread that is broken and bread that becomes us somehow. Tabernacles is the third pilgrim feast and the last of the seven festivals to be held in the seventh month of the year, and it's the great feast. Summing up all of the other uh, feasts, and, and even though I grew up in the church for most of my life, I really had no clue about, about tabernacles. And 
I think there's a reason for that. We don't have time to talk about it now. But anyway, when Peter says, I'm about to put off my skenoma, he's thinking about the feast of skenopagias, the feast of skenoma making, the feast of tabernacles, the feast of booths, in Hebrew, Sukkot. You can read about it. Exodus 34, Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy 16. In Exodus 34, it's called the feast of ingathering. For it comes in the seventh month at the end of the harvest. That's when the grapes are harvested and trampled in the wine press. Such that, you know, the blood of the grapes is transformed then into wine. This is also when the olives are harvested and they're, they're pressed into oil in, in a press. Gethsemane means garden of the olive press. With which, um, that oil with which we are anointed. Like the anointed, Christ means the anointed. This is when the entire harvest comes in. And you remember that according to Jesus, there is like this great harvest of the earth. In Leviticus 23, it's called the Feast of Booths because the Israelites were commanded to make booths, sukkah in Hebrew, uh, skonoma in Greek. They were commanded to take, this, these were the tents, they were commanded to take branches and leaves um, like fig leaves and make temporary dwellings or temporal dwellings in which they would dwell for seven days like the seven days of creation. But on the eighth day, which is also a first day, right? Because that's the start of a new week. It's the end and the beginning. An eighth day that symbolizes an endless Sabbath, God's eternal rest. On the eighth day, they were to assemble all together in one place. You can picture the eighth day as all the sevens up here on our, our timeline. Uh, that's the eighth day. All those sevens are eternal eternal eight. So think of all those sevens off the timeline as eight. And the one that's kind of on the timeline, it probably should be drawn on the timeline, is like a Sabbath in, in time, like today. <laughs> well, on the eighth day, the, the great day, Shemini Atzeret, the Israelites were to abandon their booths and assemble together. The ESV translate Atz translates Atzeret as solemn assembly, but I think a better translation would be awesome assembly because they were to experience awesome joy on the eighth day. Deuteronomy 16, God tells the Israelites, you shall rejoice in this feast. This is going to be a happy feast. And he tells them that when they have crossed over the Jordan, he would show them where they were commanded to have this party. So I just hope that you're getting this picture, right? All of Israel every year was commanded to travel to this party in Jerusalem. But for seven days they were to camp, dwell in temporal, temporary tabernacles. But on the eighth day they were to joyfully dismantle their tabernacles and assemble in the city as they sang the Hallel, Psalm 113 to 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. I've read that in Jesus' day they would have this elaborate water ceremony, right? Commemorating the fact that water came from the rock. And Jesus, Paul says Jesus is the rock. And a wine ceremony for they had just trampled the wine press, turning the, the grapes in, into wine. And, and then the the women would dance to the city and the men would dance all night long under the light of this giant menorah in the temple courtyard. Dan work, that's, that's play. So all Israel was commanded to camp for seven days to tabernacle and then cross over and celebrate as if everything was good and it is finished. In the wilderness, even God himself tabernacled with them. John 1, 14. This usually gets translated out in English versions, but um, Jesus, uh, Jesus the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, writes John. God himself tabernacled with the Israelites in the wilderness, although everyone was utterly terrified to enter his tabernacle. For without passing through the flaming swords, the knives and the flames, along with the high priest, well, that would kill you. So anyway, at the end of the week, on the eighth day, everyone was to put off their skinoma and assemble in the city at the temple. And please notice that if your skinoma is your body, well, then I suppose 
it does kill you <laughs> to put it off. But the eternal city is a new kind of skinoma. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes, We know that if the skene, the tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, lost, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this skenoma, this skene, this tent, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. And who is the life? Christ is the life. And he is our high priest. The high priest eats the sin offering and then goes behind the veil into the Holy of Holies, which is the age to come, and, and we are his body. In John 7, Jesus goes up to the Feast of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles on the Holy Mountain. John 7, 37, Peter's old friend John writes this, On the last day of the feast, the great day, that must be the eighth day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. He's talking like he's the rock. Let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit. That is the breath. It's one word, spirit and breath. And the breath is in the blood, like the life is in the blood and circulates through all the members of one body. Next, he tells them, I am the light of the world. See, Jesus is saying that the Feast of Tabernacles is somehow being fulfilled for the first time in him. As, his, as if his very body is the living temple and our final destination. In, in, in John 7, someone uh, says, is this the prophet? The prophet Moses spoke of. Some say, is this the Christ? Some say, let's kill him. They kill him on Passover. His spirit descends on the church, the assembly, at Pentecost. And then in the temple, it's like the Feast of Tabernacles. It's like it just starts to happen. I mean, everyone loses their own skenoma, their own stuff, their own tent. No one demands their own rights or hangs onto their own possessions. They share everything in common. And now here's the miracle. They do it with glad and generous hearts. And Peter stands up and he preaches saying some crazy things that I don't think anybody believes. Acts 2 verse 15. He says, these people aren't drunk, as you imagine. This is what was uttered by the prophet Joel. In the last days, Peter thought it was the last days. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. All flesh. Acts 3.19. Repent, therefore. Think differently, therefore, that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the times of the apocatastasis, the restoration of all things, about which God spoke of by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant of God made with your father, saying to Abraham and in your seed, in in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That is one huge tent. See, Peter thought that God was pulling off the Feast of Tabernacles. And that it began here in the church on Pentecost. But it wouldn't end until all the families of the earth were one family together in the New Jerusalem without end because it is the end. It's the telos that he was telling us about in 1 Peter. In the Revelation, received by Peter's best buddy, John, the Revelation ends with a new Jerusalem, which is a bride and a temple, coming down from heaven on the holy mountain with the doors wide open and a voice speaking from the throne, Look, I'm making all things new. It's the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Outside it's not the eighth day. Inside it's the eighth 
eighth day. It's the end that has no end. But to, but to enter this temple made without hands, you have to sacrifice the tabernacle that, that you have made with your own hands. The fig leaves. In Isaiah, which, you know, Jesus just constantly quotes Isaiah. In chapter 53, we read about the Passover lamb that is slain. Then in 54, we read about his bride who receives the seed and must expand the place of her tent, like at Pentecost. In chapter 60, I think we start reading about tabernacles. Jesus quotes 61, remember, to inaugurate his ministry in the synagogue. 63, we read about how he tramples the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, making blood that's wine and wine that's blood. Then in chapter 66, we read the verses that used to just scare the crap out of me more than any in all the Bible, but now I think are my favorite. Isaiah 66, 23. All flesh, this is the last verse in Isaiah, all, so if you've ever read Isaiah and got scared, you've got to read the last verse, okay? All flesh shall come to worship before me, declares the Lord. And they, all flesh, shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men that have rebelled against me, transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, and their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to what? All flesh. That verse used to utterly terrify me until I really read Isaiah and dared to believe what it said and realized that it was describing the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. The bodies, that's corpses, the, the dead bodies of the men that had rebelled against him. We read Isaiah, that's the bodies of all men. All men have rebelled. The Messiah is even numbered with the rebellers, the transgressors, according to Isaiah. The, 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 um, now all people, all flesh, um, have come out of the city. They're ecstatically praising the Lord in one new body, one new flesh. The new Jerusalem, which is a bride and the resurrected body of Christ, praising God as they look down on their own corpses, their old tabernacles being, being, being burned, devoured in the valley of Gehenna and praising God for liberating them from themselves. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death, said Paul. Starting to yell, sorry. I'm just getting excited about this. In the Revelation, it's the word of God in chapter 19 that cuts the flesh from all men. All men. That they might enter the city by the gates and become the city, the one new eternal body. Outside the city are those that run from the word of God, who is the judgment of God, the flaming sword of God, the truth of God, and so they're stuck in space and time and the tabernacles that they have made. In Zechariah 9 through 14, Zechariah prophesies all this stuff. You read it and you're just like, this is all like in the Gospels. It's all this stuff that refers to Jesus. And then he starts talking about the day. The day that has no morning or evening. The day that living waters flow from Jerusalem, like four rivers flowing from a mountaintop to all the world. The day when God's name will be one. Because, you know, we think God is two, but God's one. The day when God's name will be one. And on that day, the nations, the nations will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Chapter 14, verse 6. And if they don't party, they suffer a plague. You know what the plague is? Their flesh falls off. 14 verse 12 and, and, and 18, it rots on their body and falls off. Their flesh falls off. That sounds awful, but you see it's that flesh that has spoiled every party that you've ever been to. That flesh is your own arrogant ego. But if you would only lose yourself for the sake of the party, you would find yourself partying. In the end, everyone is at the party. And everyone enjoys the party. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, Paul writes this. <laughs> For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, that's Passover. And Christ is the firstfruits, it's singular in Greek. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, that's Pentecost, those who receive him now, his church. Then comes the end of the telos, that's the great day. At the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, when he delivers, he writes, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying, 
destroying every rule and every authority and power. Your ego is self-rule, self-authority, self-power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, you know, like grapes being trampled in a wine press. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him that God may be all in all. Church fathers like Origen and Gregory of Nyssa taught that Christ subjects all people to the Father by not only destroying the tabernacles that we have made, but by descending into the tabernacles that we are. And giving us his faith and his hope and his love, his will, his free will, his free will with which he freely subjects himself to his Father who is absolute love. Because you see, no one can truly party until they want to party. My senior year in college, Susan and I were engaged and we went camping with two couples that were married. And each couple had their own tent. Susan and I slept in one tent, but not the way our couples, the other couples slept in their tent. Not the way I wanted to sleep in one tent because we had not yet entered our covenant. But man, oh man, did did I ever want to be in the same tent with Susan? But I don't want to be in the same tent with everyone. And you see, that's a problem. Now, I don't mean this in a creepy way, all right? Don't have time to explain all that, but God wants all, God the Father, he wants all of his kids in, in one tent. It's called heaven. And you must want to go there in order to arrive. I know I've run out of time to talk about all of this, but Peter tells us he's about to put off his tent, and he wants to remind us of the divine nature that's been given to each one of us before he finishes his exodus. Verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths, when we made known to you the power and the coming, parousia, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you notice he uses the same word for his first coming that he uses for the second coming and the presence of the truth that is within the sanctuary of your soul right now. But we were eyewitnesses, he writes, of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain. We were with him and we have the prophetic word more fully word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star phosphorus that's Venus rises in your hearts in the revelation Jesus says I am the bright and morning star and now remember what we read in first Peter 3 3 as he encouraged the women you know to love their husbands Peter then wrote this let your cosmos let your world be the hidden man of the heart So you understand, Bride of Christ? Jesus is the light of love rising in your world, the world that is your own heart. He is the truth in you. The morning star rises in your hearts, verse 20, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation or explanation. He's saying, look, we didn't make this stuff up. It's not psychology or sociology. It's not some new science and technology. It's not a a book of good advice in order for you to make your life better. It's revelation. It's not just fruit from a tree to use however you want to use it. It's not your creation. It's the word of God which creates you. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But, False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies or factions or parties, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Now let me just remind you 
as, as I did on Easter, that Peter famously denied the master, right? And he brought on himself a quick destruction, just as he told us on Easter, but the Lord still bought him. From the foundation of the world. When Peter preached in Acts 3 about the restoration of all things, he then said this, like Moses said, like Moses told you, every soul that doesn't listen to that prophet, the prophet, the Christ, will be destroyed from the presence of the people. You see, until someone listens to Christ, they are lost. Apolumi, which can be translated destroyed or lost, or apololos. The lost and trapped in their own mind outside the city until the truth sets them free from their own tabernacle and gives them the desire to party. Verse 2, and many will follow their sensuality or lawlessness, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed, they will exploit you. They will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, Tartarus, the lowest level of Hades, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, verse 9, the day of judgment, and I'm going to stop right there. Because I just want you to notice that Peter is not telling the story the way we usually tell the story in our American evangelical churches. These false teachers like the fallen angels are not cast into hell and punishment as a result of the judgment. The false teachers are cast into the punishment in hell in preparation for the judgment. What Peter calls the day of judgment which is the day of the Lord, which comes like a thief in the night, chapter 3, verse 10, next chapter, which is the day of God, verse 12, which is the day of eternity, verse 18, which is the eighth day, which is the great day at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, the end, which is the beginning and the way, the telos, which according to Peter in his last letter, is at hand. So this is the question. How are we to know the truth? And not be exploited. Well, when I was lying to the kids in my youth group, you know, and they were just eating it up, and I suddenly realized that I could totally exploit them if I wanted to, what was it that I was offering them? I was offering them special knowledge of good and evil that they could use to save themselves from the end. And so to what was I appealing? I was appealing to their desire to use this knowledge of good and evil to build their own tabernacle where, you know, they could sit like with a shotgun and save themselves from God and their neighbors. The devil keeps us in lifelong bondage through the fear of death, says Scripture. And who is the Antichrist? Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians that he tries to take the seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, and aren't we the temple? John writes that there are many antichrists and that the spirit of the antichrist is already in the world. So there may be an antichrist like Joe Biden or Donald Trump. I mean, to put the Bill of Rights in the Bible, does, that should, like, ah. It could be, could be like Donald Trump or Joe, Joe Biden, one of those guys, but the antichrist, the imitation Christ, that you need to concern yourself with, I, I think, I think what he's saying, the antichrist you really need to concern yourself with is you. If you try to save yourself with yourself, you are your own savior and you're sitting on the throne in your temple, which belongs to Jesus. 
666 is, does appear to be some sort of reference to Emperor Nero, but John, or John also says in the Revelation it's a human number. Six is the number of man. That's the day on which man is created. And at the sixth hour, the sixth day of the week, the sixth day of creation, man tried to save himself from what? The Word of God. So false teachers will appeal to your desire to save yourself while Jesus whispers, Come sacrifice yourself with me, with me. False prophets will appeal to your ego, your tabernacle, and true prophets will testify to Jesus in whom all things hold together. The Antichrist will make you fear the judgment because the Christ is the judgment. <laughs> and the judgment is eternal life. I know the Father's commandment, said Jesus. It's eternal life. And you already, you, you know him. You know him for like Peter told us at the start, he's already with you. He's the truth implanted in your heart. And he is who it is that you are listening to whenever you are honest. People say, well, that's subjective. <laughs> he's the subject that controls all things. You see, the truth is the way and the life. He's not a forest stranger. He's the shepherd of your heart. I once prayed with a young girl who had listened to an evil spirit who had told her that he was her friend and she needed him as a friend because when Jesus returned, she would be left behind. The demon exploited her fears with a bunch of ridiculous theological mumbo jumbo about the time of the end and trapped her, trapped her in despair. In prayer, I reminded her that she knew Jesus. I, I knew this girl. She knew Jesus. And I told her to look for Jesus, and she had a vision of Jesus and herself sitting on his lap as he held her in a swing. And I said to her, I said, ask him if he would um, ask him. I said, look at him in the eye and, and ask him if he would leave her behind. Ask him if he would leave you behind. And she was quiet for a minute, and she said, he looked me in the eye, and he said, I would rather be left behind than leave one little girl behind. And at that, the demon lost his power and had to leave. She didn't know much. She didn't know about eschatology, theology, or Greek verbs, but she knew Jesus because Jesus knows her. He will come like a thief in the night, but he's not a thief in the night. In fact, there's nothing he can steal because it all belongs to him. He's coming to his own house like a thief in the night, but he's not a thief in the night. About 35 years ago, due to a crisis suffered from a friend, by a friend, I, I came home really, really late and unexpectedly from this long youth group trip. Susan was asleep, and this was long before cell phones, and I didn't want to scare her, but the key, you know, it jiggled in the lock. I bumped into something there in the dark as I snuck into our place like a thief in the night, and then I heard the sound of absolute terror. Oh, my God! My God, who's there? Who's there? And then I spoke, and she knew my voice. And then we slept in one tent, and it turned out to be a most enjoyable night. So listen to the gospel. He's not a thief in the night. He's your husband, and you you already know his voice. You must no longer fear the end. For the end is everything you most deeply desire and yet don't know that you desire for you still think that you have to save yourself from him. Him who came to save you from yourself. Do you remember? Do you remember what he looks like? Do you remember what he sounds like? 
on the night that he was betrayed by all of us. He, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Eat it. Do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. And then he said this, I will not drink it again until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's talking Feast of Tabernacles. <laughs> and one really, really, really big tent. White cups are juice. Brown cups are wine. Time to come to the feast. In Jesus' name, means salvation. Amen. Amen. And so, Lord God, we thank you that your love never fails because you are love. Of course you don't fail. Forgive us for thinking that you would fail, Lord God. And even when it seems like you fail, you conquer, you die and rise again. Uh, but not just by yourself. You lead a host of spirits uh, captive in you, um, our Messiah, our temple, our eternal home. So we praise you, Lord Jesus. And we say it in, in your name. Amen. See, there's power in the name of Jesus. Not simply because the name Jesus means Yahweh is salvation, but there's power in the name of Jesus because it's a name attached to a person. You know, if I say shotgun, the shotgun will just sit there. It won't do anything. There's no power in the name of shotgun. But if I say Jesus, I'm talking to a person. I'm calling on a name, not an object but a subject who is the Savior and who knows you so, so you can know him. So how do we know the truth? I kind of mentioned politics, and I'm sorry about that. I don't want to want to mention politicians because of this. I, I might convince you that one of them is the Christ or the Antichrist. And I don't think they're either. And all politicians appeal to the Bill of Rights. I just was kind of shocked when I saw someone had put it in the Bible. But why do they do that? Because you think the evil one tells you that you have a right uh, to life. And he tells you that you have a right to choice. Which means that you have a right to not die. And because of that right, then you um, want the help of politicians that will help you build a tabernacle to protect yourself. But to salvation is to go here and to die with him that you might live with him. And so the antichrist you need to worry about is your flesh. And if the antichrist ever comes into your bedroom late in the middle of the night going, Bleh! all you have to do is call in the name of Jesus. I mean, it kind of blows my mind, but it's actually true. So, in the name of Jesus, believe the gospel. Amen. Amen.